Welcome to the Pritzker Military Museum and Library's Virtual Learning Studio in Chicago, Illinois. I'm Jacqueline Moronic, Associate Director of Education here at the PMML. Founded in 2003, the Pritzker Military Museum and Library's mission is to increase the public's understanding of the military history, military affairs, and national security by providing a forum for the study and exploration of our military, past, present, and future, with a specific focus on their stories, sacrifices, and values. With national and global reach, these spaces and events aim to share the stories of those who served, helping citizens everywhere appreciate the relationship between the armed forces and the civilians whose freedoms they protect. The Virtual Learning Studio offers monthly webinars designed especially for teachers to use in classrooms grades 6 through 12, and they are useful for any age beyond. Be sure to sign up for our emails and go to our website for more information on upcoming programs featuring guest speakers from across the country. 82 years ago today, Japan attacked the United States Naval Base at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, plunging our nation into World War II. As thousands and thousands of soldiers traveled to Europe, Africa, and Asia, letters to and from home became critical resources of hope and resilience, but they were also numerous and bulky. So the military devised a new way for troops and their loved ones to communicate, victory mail. Female combined lightweight, stationary, and microfilm, which could be transported by airplanes. This not only saved space on ships for other vital military supplies, but also helped people keep in contact during wartime conditions. The Pritzker Military Museum and Library joins Lynn Heidelbaugh of the National Postal Museum to discuss this interesting piece of American history. Lynn Heidelbaugh is a curator at the Smithsonian National Postal Museum, where she specializes in research and acquisitions on the history of postal communications. On behalf of the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, it gives me great pleasure to welcome today's speaker, Lynn Heidelbaugh. Welcome, Lynn. Thank you, Jackie. Um, I'm really honored to be speaking with you all today uh, about V-mail communication used during World War II. And to give you a sense of what I'll be covering, uh, I'll talk about what is V-mail, what's with that name, um, why microfilm letters, and how did it work? In the After we do a and a I'll go into a little bit more about what it was like to read and write uh, V-mail. And um, pulled one object from the collection of the National Postal Museum. This is a V-mail letter that was written um, about uh, two years, two and a half years into the war. And writing in the summer of 1944, Navy Lieutenant uh, Joseph um, uh, Clark sent a letter to his friend, um, and he was writing about his view looking down the naval base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. The lively scene that he was looking at was, was full of ships and airplanes and sailors at work in 1944, and he wrote of a sense of positivity for the future. He expressed in this letter, as I quote, here buzz the wheels that will carry our nation to total victory through the fleet. And the confidence in the war effort caught my attention when I was reading this. Um, Joseph Clark sent this letter to his friend, Joseph Spiegelberg, who was also serving in the Navy. And it was that word victory that he used in that quote that I read that caught my attention. The victory echoes the intentions of that stationary paper on which Joseph typed this letter. In that red box at the bottom of the page is printed V-mail with the letter V and the Morse code dot, 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 dash, which also represented the letter V. Taking a closer look at that uh, part of the stationery, we can see that detail of the V and the dot, 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 dash. The special V-mail stationery was designed to help with the war effort and to bring victory for the U.S. and the Allies. The use, the use of the word victory and the symbol V were popular forms of expression of hope and camaraderie among the allied countries before the U.S. joined the war in December 1941. And those symbols and sentiments were quickly adopted by the Americans. Applying a V and a sense of victory to the mail was designed to inspire patriotic sentiments among military personnel and civilians to encourage them to contribute to the war effort by conserving resources without compromising on communications and the much loved letters that they wanted to write and receive. V-mail was to be used for speeding communication with US military personnel serving overseas. It was to help friends and family to stay in contact, to keep them communicating with each other 
to keep up morale and lift spirits in the face of the dangers and potential losses of the war. It took the coordination of the U.S. government, the post office, and the business community to develop V-mail and to convince civilians and military personnel to adopt this kind of unusual mode of communication. Over 16 million men and women served in the U.S. Armed Forces during the course of the war, and of that number, about 73% served overseas. Um, their service overseas averaged about um, a time of more than a year. So it's a very long, substantial amount of time for someone to be separated from family, friends, and their home communities, which caused many millions of Americans to want to stay in contact and use the mail. The letters and postcards and new V-mail were really the only affordable and readily available communication modes to help bridge the distance. Telephones were uh, very expensive, particularly at the front, um, really kind of on, almost non-existent to military personnel on non-official duties, as were telegrams. So mail was pretty much it if you wanted to reach anybody you cared about. Facing the demand for reliable and timely movement of messages in the mail, the military and the post office looked for solutions. They partnered with the Kodak Company and took inspiration from a mail system that Great Britain started in 1941 to microfilm their troops' letters and then fly that home to Britain. The U.S. government announced that it would do a new mode of messaging on June 15, 1942. That was just six months after the U.S. entered the war. It was a tremendous feat in a short period of time. There's a whole new service available for how to mail things uh, for the civilian and postal system. Um, it was made available to the public and to the military. Special stationery, like you saw on the other slide, was printed in the millions. Thousands of civilian and military staff were trained in photographic processing and postal uh, handling. A campaign that went into full swing to promote V-mail for military and uh, civilians uh, went out in posters just like these three here, and they appealed to the patriotic sentiments. They provided information um, and they told you how to use female. It was sent out in newspapers and newsreels, radio shows and advertising, explaining how to use female and why letter writers should opt for female over their usual traditional kinds of letters. Well, email was used for only um, 41 months between June 1942 and November 1945. In that time, it's estimated that over 1 billion letters were sent as female. And um, the stationary, stationary was key to that, that standardized stationary and the microfilming process of email produced lighter and smaller cargo that could be transported more efficiently on ships and airplanes. Reducing the size and weight of mail meant that more space could be available for other war supplies, and still more letters could reach military personnel faster around the globe. It was a way to handle that rapidly expanding volume of wartime mail without restricting how people sent personal letters. Well, maybe change it a little bit about how they sent them, um, and but it also uh, they were still allowed to use the others. They were just encouraged opt for female. This advertisement by the Kodak Company highlighted the process and the benefits of email by pointing out the partnership of the business company with the U.S. government. Kodak supplied the photographic equipment needed for filming and the original letters, and then they reprinted them on photographic paper. That was about a quarter size of the original eight and a half, 11 sheet. In all those steps of the process, the goal was to reduce that size and weight of the mail so it could be transported um, more readily while still allowing the military to move everything else they needed to get overseas, the troops and uh, the food for the troops, as well as medicines and armaments. The process can um, look a little bit complex in this diagram, um, but actually it's it's quite analog compared to what we're used today. Um, it is very technical in terms of what it was like to print a V-mail at the time with using uh, all the photographic chemicals, um, but it really took everybody involved from the letter writer to 
uh, those in the military and the civilian postal employees to get that mail into the hands of uh, the waiting recipient. So going through a couple of those steps, if you were a letter writer, you would get a piece of stationery like this. Um, this is one of the pieces from the National Postal Museum collection shown in various stages of how you folded your V-mail letter. So starting over on the left is that full sheet and uh, that's all you get to write your message on. Uh, probably about 300 words would fit if you're writing by hand and maybe 500 or so if you were typing. People did both. And uh, one caveat was that they were asked not to write in pencil because it was too light of a shade for the microfilming machinery to pick up and it wouldn't reproduce well. Um, and so when using the sheet, you'd fill that out, you'd fold it up into its own um, envelope because on the other side of it was printed a place for you to put the outgoing address. And so the next stage was, of course, um, to drop that letter that you just wrote into any mailbox, both military and um, civilians could do this. Once that got into the mail stream, it was um, especially diverted over to those who were about to scan it and make uh, microfilm reels from those pictures. You can see the military personnel here running some of those letter sheets through a Kodak Recordat machine, which was microfilming those sheets of paper. You see a little strip of some of the cells of a reel of microfilm over there on the right. About um, 1,500 or so letters could fit on a 90 foot long reel of film. And then that film was taken to the airport. Um, it was put in a sacks um, and uh, loaded onto airplanes. Now, sometimes with everything in life, there's always exceptions. There were times that V-mail went by ship, took a little bit longer. Um, but really the idea of trying to reduce this amount of cargo space was to also enable it to go through a more, uh, the most quick way to, to move things. And that was the airplanes. It was also the most secure way at the time during World War II. Um, the shipping lines um, and the convoys of ships were far more subject to being attacked um, by, by enemy um, and by enemy uh, submarines than an airplane was liable to be, um, to be attacked. So this gave those who opted to use V-mail a little bit of a sense of assurance that their letter was going to get there. Um, it also, because they were microfilming those letters, meant that those reels um, were, were a copy. And back home where the letters were, were waiting, they wouldn't uh, destroy those letters until they got an all clear that that microfilm had been printed. So next, looking at some of what it took to get that film back into a printed form so that the waiting recipient would read an actual letter and not just a tiny little piece of microfilm. So you see lots of um, equipment here was really about enlarging that strip of uh, microfilm on those reels and being able to print that onto photographic paper that the recipient would get. Uh, the machinery over here on the left is printing some of those um, those photographs of those letters. And you can see the woman there is working to cut each of those individual letters um, that have been printed on that photo paper. It gives a good sense, I think, about the size of what V-mail, once it was printed from that microfilm, gives you a good sense of what how big it was. It's about the size of, uh, of her hand, uh, about four by six. Uh, for each of those letters. So really you went from eight and a half by 11 to four by six, um, which meant that those who might have printed uh, with very small hand writing um, meant that it could be a challenge on the other end for those reading it. And as I mentioned, this, uh, this kind of letter was going um, by the millions. And so there was also very large equipment like the photos in here of multiple printings of these photographic prints. What those looked like when uh, you received them 
was, as I said, about a quarter of the size of the original. It was always in black and white, um, being a photographic print. Um, and you would receive that in a very small envelope with the address showing. So this is a all made possible by that specially designed stationery, which allowed you to fold the letter in such a way that the address appeared on um, the inside so that it would show up on that envelope that you have here. But sometimes um, everybody skipped that microfilling process. Um, as you can see here, this Coast Guardsman is holding a full sheet of uh, V-mail that he has received in the mail. Sometimes that full sheet was delivered instead of a microfilming. This could be opted for because maybe there was, um, it was just more expeditious to skip the microfilming stage, depending on where the sender and receiver were. Um, sometimes it meant that um, there was an airplane ready to go, but there was a ship and so the, the letters went on there. But the beauty of that letter sheet that he's holding is that it both could enable that microfilming to be able to go through those machines, or it was light awake enough that it could go on an airplane and not be as, as heavy as a traditional letter, which might be multiple pages and um, have an envelope and could really take up a large amount of the cargo space when you start filling that with thousands and thousands of letters just like that. So I'm going to play a, um, a short audio clip now um, from the collection at the Library of Congress. Um, this is a piece that was part of the promotional campaign. Um, it's several clips of telling the public about how to send mail by V-mail and why to use this when sending letters to the service personnel. You'll hear lots of information about how important it was to get your address correct. Um, and so you'll hear that there's several sort of repetitions of, of all those instructions. Delays can be avoided and your letters more expeditiously handled if they are properly addressed. Always remember to use the soldier's full name and rank, his army serial number, his service organization and unit, and his army post office number. The Army Postal Service is now dispatching some 20 million pieces of mail overseas every week making this the greatest overseas mail handling problem ever confronted by any postal system, either in peacetime or during war. You should do your part in assisting the Army Postal Service to get these letters to the men at the front by using extreme care in addressing your letters and by using V-mail when writing to soldiers overseas. Remember... When you write, use V-mail. Always exercise care in addressing overseas mail. Use the latest address provided by the soldier, as he is in the best possible position to know what it is. Remember that misaddressed mail means long delays in transit and delivery. To avoid loss through enemy action while en route, use V-mail. Make your letters cheery. Eliminate bad or depressing news. Write clearly and legibly. When sending packages, make certain they are packed securely. Always take the destination involved into consideration when considering overseas mail transit time. Delays in overseas mail in wartime are unavoidable. Don't add to this by improperly or insufficiently addressing his mail. So as you heard, addresses are very important. It was the only way that um, you're getting this uh, into the hands of the intended recipient. Some of those uh, tricky parts of addressing uh, military personnel was that their address isn't quite 
uh, what we're used to. Um, they didn't have a street address. They didn't have a town on there. They would have uh, usually an APO number, which stands for Army Post Office, or FPO, standing for Fleet Post Office, which serves the Navy and uh, Marine Corps. So you had to know the right number for that APO and FPO. And those could change depending on where the person uh, was. If they got uh, reassigned, if they ended up in hospital, um, those were things that the military kept track of and tried to keep that location information. But as that radio announcement said, um, the best way to get the accurate address is to get it from uh, the military personnel that you're trying to correspond with. So those kind of public announcements put a lot of onus on the people that are writing those letters and trying to send them. Um, and you may have also heard how it's uh, also instructing you not only how to address it on the outside, to use the email, but also what to say in your letters and trying to keep um, the spirits up while um, people are in a very stressful situation of uh, being at war both on the home front and on the front lines, um, the, the worry could be um, very stressful for both. And that mail was seen as a way to help share reassurances and share the news. Um, so next we'll go to uh, a short Q&A. Uh, thank you for this first half of the presentation. This has been very interesting. We did have one um, one guest mentioned that the speaker in that video sounded like FDR. And I, I don't know if he was actually the one who recorded that message or not, but um, true. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, it's not on the record, but yes, it does. Yeah. That's a great observation. Yeah. That's so funny. Great, great catch there. Um, Somebody's asked what happened to the microfilm? Excellent question. Um, So the microfilm was, they would hold on to it. Um, until they got uh, a message back from the receiving station that they had gotten it, that they had printed it out, and that mail was on its way to be being delivered. At that point, they were to destroy it. And that was all to give um, privacy to, particularly to the civilian writers who had privacy uh, to the contents of their mail. That you bring up an interesting point because one of the um one of the slides that you showed us talked about the pathway that the mail takes. And there was a little section there that um, that was surprising to me. Are you going to talk about that a little later on? Okay. I will. And I think that that's censorship, right? Yes. The, uh, yes. And that's, that's just for the military. And I'll go into some of that detail. Um, somebody also asked, did V-mail also include the cheap sound recordings that were popular during World War II? <laughs> Oh, those are um, really interesting pieces where it would be a phonograph record that could be recorded. And so that wasn't in V-mail. Um, the V-mail was limited to that one sheet of paper, but that was another um, package that was uh, available, particularly with partnerships with um, nonprofit organizations that would set up recording booths, um, as particularly uh, the USO um, was one that had recording booths that allowed people to record a short message and mail that um, home. Oh, that's really neat. Thank you for that question. Um, one more question before we let you dive back into your presentation. And that is, why why did they not then, if, if, if email was easy and fast, why didn't they incorporate that into just national mail service? It was really about that long distance um, transportation and particularly that long distance transportation in those uh, wartime conditions where the, the shipping lines were in grave danger of being attacked. Um, so how can they remove some of the material that was going on those shipping lines, um, put that on the, the airlines, which were not under attack at the, the same amount, um, and, and give that little bit of insurance policy that this material is going through, but also the ships were really needed for all the very heavy equipment. Think of every, every tank and every tent that somebody has slept in has to go on those ships as well. Yeah. So it was not the same kind of need within the United States and the continental United States. We had lots of railway lines to handle the mail and handle um, the material equipment. I will say digital communication, I think, has 
has taken over now, but they didn't jump at this first chance. Um, so then I guess one more question. Do you have a specific time frame for a delivery of a piece of mail? Well, I guess general specific time frame. Yeah, it all it depended on uh, where you were. Um, the farther out you were um, around the globe, the longer it was going to take, not just by distance, but um, just coordinating that network was um, really complicated. Um, those who were uh, in the Navy and a Marine Corps, of course, they had to keep track of where the ships were, where they were bound. And um, usually that mail, sometimes it would get there ahead of them, knowing what port they would come to. Um, but it also meant that it, often that mail was trailing <laughs> those, mm -hmm. um, those ships. But um, it also meant that uh, where you were, if you were closer to the front line, it was took more time to get there. There were more steps. Um, but generally, sort of a, a sh shorthand, you know, on a good on a good and smooth um, route, it could take anywhere from you know, four weeks, of, uh, but really probably two weeks and like the most extraordinary well, best luck situations, but you were doing well with, um, with four weeks. Wow. That is a little longer than I thought, but yeah. <laughs> I guess with the, with the numbers of pieces of mail, I'm sure that was pretty yeah. efficient. And you'll see some that'll be, you know, four days a, a week. It all depends on which airplane it might have landed on to get get out um, get out of town and get into somebody's hands. Well, thank you for having all of this answer, all these answers to us offhand. Um, I'm going to let you um, pick up with your second half. So in this half, I'll go a little bit more into what it was like um, to read and write of emails. Why did people choose to use this over other forms of particularly mail? Um, and what did v mail contribute to the war effort? So during the height of the war in 1944, the post office conducted a survey and they found of the 11 million men and women serving in the military at that time, they were sending an average of six pieces of mail a week. Um, that was up significantly from what most Americans have been sending uh, before the war, but um, certainly not at the, the rate that we exchange messages and information today in our multimedia um, options available to us to communicate. But um, to the post office department, when they came across that uh, statistic, uh, it was really kind of uh, eye-opening and uh, another reason why they knew knew that they needed a system like V-Mail where they could help reduce that um, amount of the resources that went into the actually the physical piece of the mail. So photographs like the one you're seeing here show a uh, sailor writing uh, his letter and a, a woman re receiving that letter. Um, pretty much a uh, obvious that it to me that it is a staged photograph um, where you're qu clearly seeing that he's um, writing the letter and she's receiving the same letter as the photographic print, um, writing a Christmas greeting v-mail. And it's very clear that uh, they're promoting v-mail with that sign behind the sailor there um, and promoting that it will help reduce the amount of cargo space that mail will take up. So um, always messaging in, in many different ways um, that the post office and the military were using to both promote this to personnel as well as civilians at home. So civilians weren't just reading the letters, they were certainly writing the letters on the home front as well. Um, this is a V-mail letter that traveled from New York to the South Pacific. Ruth Spiegelberg filled out the one-page stationery with a brief message for her husband, Joseph, who was with a Navy construction battalion. The letter was not microfilmed, as you might notice, um, and this was because Ruth wrote this email after microfilming ceased to be used in November 1945, um, pretty much in those months at the end of the, at the, end of the war. And the letter sh sheets could still be used um, during that time. Um, and over the course of the running of V-Mail in those 41 months from 1942 to 1945, V-Mails from the States alone 
to mil sent to military overseas uh, numbered over 500 million females. Um, and one reason that it was particularly attractive to those at home to send a letter like this was that it actually was a cheap way to get that speedy service of airmail. So when you look on the other side of this letter from the museum's collection, um, you can see that uh, Ruth has addressed her name at the top and she's addressed her husband right in the middle um, there in the two, but she's also included the postage stamp in the upper right corner. That postage is for three cents. Um, and it was a discount because she was getting airmail service for this letter, meaning that it was going faster, but she didn't have to pay the airmail rate of six cents. So she got 50% off on her letters. Um, so that was really attractive to a lot of civilians who were sending mail. Civilians could also get free stationery for V-mail. They could go to their local post office and get three sheets of V-mail every day. So certainly the post office and the government who were freely supplying this stationery wanted people to use it um, and, and made that available by making it, well, even more than just affordable. Um, so certainly economics was part of the plan. Um, and the government advised civilians how to write. Um, they told them to keep it short, keep those cheerful, but keep writing those letters frequently. And that radio announcement, like we listened to, the advertisements and the posters, if email is about promoting that speed and security. Um, and the propaganda assured civilians that their mail would remain private, even if it was opened uh, for that microfilming. Um, privacy in the mail is part of uh, federal law. And there were descriptions in all of the many of those promotional campaigns about how the process worked and details were given to the civilians to assure them that their, their mail was private, that the items that were filmed and turned into microfilm, that that film would be destroyed, and that the original letters that were filmed, that would be destroyed in the end as well. Um, all of that paper was actually um, bound for being uh, pulped and reused. So recycling and conserving resources were a very important part of the entire V-mail system. Uh, but this was very different experience from the civilian side of using V-mail and even using just mail uh, entirely than it was experienced by the military. Military letters were subject to being uh, censored by military personnel. Uh, this was because it was seen as a uh, security issue. That there may be information in these letters that if it fell into the wrong hands, fell into the enemy hands, could endanger lives. Um, and so Officers were assigned to read the letters of uh, those who they commanded in their unit. And there were whole offices of censors um, that were handling lots of mail, particularly those who had language skills were um, sent to be censors of mail because there were multiple languages that people were, uh, in the military were, were speaking and writing. And so to, to be able to look for the kind of sensitive information that they had to have language skills. The officers would be reviewing the V-mails and any ordinary regular letters and postcards for details such as um, locations. Where is the company going to move to next? Do, um, do they start talking about a battle that they know is upcoming? Those are the kind of things that need to be removed from the letters in order to um, protect people. Um, and also to look to see if somebody is having a pattern of repeating uh, this kind of information. And the question is, are they a spy? Um, so it wasn't just V-mail that the uh, military was censoring and looking for. It was all kinds of military mail, personal and uh, official. So when a V-mail was censored, it was uh, done by using ink to black out portions of the letter. 
Um, and then like this piece here, this was a letter that then was um, microfilmed and printed. So we can see that the letter sent from Army Corporal Chard to his minister, uh, Dr. Floyd Leach, um, in the middle of the end of November 1943. Um, part of that has been taken out by the censor. Um, I do, I'm very curious about what he might have written in that second line. Reading that first is kind of tantalizing, where uh, Corporal Chard wrote, quote, well, the Army did it again this time. And now we don't know what's um, behind what got blacked out, but I do want to know what they did. Um, and we probably will never know, which is the intent of censoring. Now, censoring wasn't um, really well received by anyone. Most of the officers that had to read the mail were, it was an extra duty to do. Um, and many questioned, you know, is this um getting us anywhere. Is this really protecting um, us and protecting the information? Um, and as many people deal with it, these kind of situations, you make light of it. And just like this cartoon is showing a holiday greeting, which has been centered with um, parts of it cut out of the letter. Um, what I find funny about this cartoon is that that kind of censorship uh, technique of cutting out letters was common. Um, but certainly couldn't have been done with a V-mail because that would have uh, would never have been able to fit through that microphone filming machine. And cartoons and greetings like this were common in V-mails. Um, usually somebody in a, a company, maybe somebody with a, a great comic sense um, and some artistic skill would draw something, bring it to the, the nearby V-mail station, get it printed, and that was typically then distributed among the, the company. Um, could be anything from a birthday card to um, some jokes that they were sending to each other. We have one in the collection that is a, a Valentine um, that was distributed and available for a military members to use. Typically, these are usually in a like, very small area that um, it wasn't everybody in the European theater had it be somebody if you were around a post office, a certain V-mail station, many people would be using the same kind of greeting V-mail um, stationery. Uh, so you get very specific, say, in the Pacific Theater or the uh, European Theater. Um, this individual just illustrated the V-mail uh, himself, um, sending this letter on um, May 7th, 1945, and recognition of the end of the war in Europe. Um, and he chose the patriotic imagery of raising the flag in the Pacific theater at Iwo Jima. But uh, the end of the war would not, uh, would come, come a few months later. So there are ways to personalize and make V-mail that one sheet of paper uh, your own like this. Um, this next sample is one of the few I have seen with a photograph um, embedded into the V-mail. You are not allowed to put anything into your, your V-mail when you folded it up and mailed it. Anything that you had folded in there would have been, um, would have hindered all the microfilming. Um, so you were told not to do that. Um, people who tried to enclose photographs or newspaper clippings or something like that, um, those went by the wayside and into the waste paper basket. There was a program in, uh, particularly in Chicago, by the local newspaper that um, did supply photographs. They sent out their photographic journalists to um, new families with mothers with young babies who had um, not seen their deployed fathers. And so the photojournalists took photos of the babies, brought them to the V-mail station and had them printed on uh, V-mail stationery. And those were sent out um, as a expedited mail so that um, waiting fathers could see their, their children for the first time. But otherwise, it was really kind of hard to personalize uh, V-mail. There were stories in newspapers about um, when women kissed the a V-mail letter uh, with their lipstick to um, leave a sort of a sign of love. 
But um, that was uh, problem problematic for the filming process. So when trying to put those letter sheets with that lipstick, um, put those into that microfilming machinery, it gunked up the system. And uh, the reports call this the Scarlet Scourge because of the popularity of red colored lipstick. So certainly writers and recipients had to adapt the way that they were communicating, particularly when they were writing a V-mail and using that very small space. But uh, those who were at the post office uh, working the mail and the military who worked the mail also had to have specialized training and adaptation to add in the V-mail service. The civilians here, um, shown in these two photographs, were uh, sorting the mail for the military. You can see the clerk on the left has a whole case of um, letters where he's sorting it to the next location that it should be going to. This was all for a V-mail handling system. So all of the mail uh, in the States went through three main ports for uh, V-mail handling. Uh, it was Chicago handled everything from the central states. New York and San Francisco handled the East Coast and West Coast um, respectively. And then overseas, it was the military personnel who handled uh, the military mail and handled V-mail. There were over 100 V-mail stations um, spread out across the globe, everywhere from the hot tropics like uh, this group who were sent to the South Pacific to very cold stations in uh, Greenland uh, and Alaska that needed heaters, whereas those in the tropics of the South Pacific had to have air conditioning units um, set up so that the photographic equipment uh, worked efficiently. Those who worked in the postal system and the VMAIL system overseas took pride in their work for their war effort. Um, although they weren't at the front line, they saw their job as vital in keeping up morale uh, for those who are facing battles and those who are warring back at home. Um, this is a, a very odd piece that we came across in the museum's collection, and it is a bamboo in which um, that letter, the type letter that you can see below, was enclosed. It was sent by uh, Marine Corps Major E.L. Fraze of the 3rd Marine Division, um, sent it back to his boss in Washington, D.C. in 1943, and in the section um, that I've pulled from the letter there. It talks about the V-mail station. Um, he said, quote, we have experienced cases where V-mail has been received within four days after being written. I've received letters from Mrs. Fraze on an average of eight days after mailing. So as I spoke before earlier in the, the question and answer section, it could be a very long time to get mail, but sometimes it could be very quick. And since he's talking to his um, boss here, who is a postal official about the mail, he wants to tell him it's moving very quickly. Um, and here is a photo of Major Frace um, on, on Guadalcanal at the post office in the V-mail facility. You can see above him uh, some of that same kind of bamboo that he used to mail his letter back to his, his boss in the States. For his work as a um, setting up the postal facilities, he received a, a bronze star. In the European theater, uh, the 688th Central Postal Directory Battalion um, was the only African-American unit of the Women's Army Corps that served overseas during World War II, um, particularly during the segregated um, era of the U.S. Army uh, history. The women found the mail um, stacked up when they were arriving in England in 1945. It had been uh, backed up, particularly after the, the Battle of the Bulge and uh, bad weather and um, large troop movements in the, in the months previous. To handle all that mail, the battalion members worked 24 hour uh, shifts. Um, they worked, uh, well, 24 hours a day in shifts. They worked seven days a week and they were able to process the mail in just a few months. 
Uh, one of their jobs was to update the addresses. You can see um, the clerks here working to look at the piece of uh, the letter and then compare it to an updated address card. So very detail-oriented work um, that uh, took a lot of uh, patience and um, observation skills. The members of the 6888 uh, worked with a motto in mind, no male, low morale. The 855 members of uh, the battalion, which is often called the 6888s, received the high honor of the Congressional Medal in 2022. It took decades before their meritorious service was officially uh, acknowledged. And so there certainly were uh, a number of extraordinary people that were deployed to do that special work on um, postal and V-mail processing. Um, there were lots of materials that were sent out around the globe to make sure that the microfilming uh, was happening in V-mail and the letters were being delivered. So did you using V-mail um, help in the war effort? That's my question. Um, some of the photos I'm going to show next are, uh, again, of some propaganda photos. The, the ones that I've been showing you have all been from the National Archives, coming from the records of the Army uh, and the Navy. Um, these are some kind of fun uh, promotional pieces where they're showing you the mountains of letters compared to the small size of that microfilmed reels. And according to a 1944 fact sheet uh, published by the Office of Information, the savings um, made by V-Mail were phenomenal. V-Mail, they estimated, saved about 5 million pounds of cargo weight, which allowed um, for then 2 million of rations for the troops to be sent, 5,000 um, excuse me, 500,000 rifles and millions of packages of med medicine that could be sent instead of the traditional um, heavy and large and bulky uh, mail. And so officials estimated that V-mail saved up to 98% on cargo weight in space, all because of the microfilming, but also using that one page letter sheet. So in that 41 um, month period of using V-mail between June 1942 and um, the end of 1945, over 550 million pieces of V-mail were sent from the U.S. to military post offices, and over 510 million pieces were received from military personnel abroad that came back to the U.S. So that added up to over a billion V-mails. And in spite of the patriotic draw of V-mail, people still love to send regular mail. They still like to get their um, their own stationery and uh, be able to use pages and pages and, and express themselves how they wanted in, v um, in their own letters. And so in looking at um, how that was just for comparison's sake, in 1944, the Navy took a statistic that there were 38 million pieces of email exchanged, but there were 272 million pieces of regular first class mail. So um, a little bit tipping the scales towards that first class mail, but Vmail still did um, pretty well for a whole new system. Since um, the Vmail operations ceased in November 1945, the post office and today's uh, Department of Defense have never returned to using microfilm technology for personal mail. There have been other forms of the, kind of a hybrid between using other technologies, um, particularly using the internet, um, and then creating physical pieces of mail, but microfilm has never been uh, used um, outside the time period of, of World War II. And so and in conclusion, when I think about V-mail, it was a boost to um, morale. It gave people a sense that they could keep writing without stressing the, the systems of, and they could keep um, those resources moving. But uh, it certainly took a lot of skill and a lot of um, a lot of equipment to get that mail moving around the world. Thank you, Lynn. The this has been some fascinating stuff, and I, I learned so much that just a cursory look on Google didn't quite cover for me. I appreciate you sharing your knowledge and expertise with us. I do have a question in the Q&A. Some great questions today. Was V-mail a predecessor to the reduced rate postal aerogram? 
Um, yeah, it's uh, about the same time period. That's a great question because it is what aerogram is that self folding um, one sheet that becomes a um, becomes its own envelope. So it's a, a similar format. Um, I had a question. Do, does the Smithsonian in the collection, do you have any examples of those pieces of mail that were considered detrimental that had to be, that weren't even allowed to be sent because they were considered the work of spies, that covert activity? Uh, we have one that we have a couple from uh, maybe like five or so from one individual. Um, and uh, some of his are censored with the, the ink and some of his letters were not at all censored. Um, some of them, there is one where it's probably like half a sheet of paper, if that. Um, so the censor certainly just chopped it down. <laughs> and uh, I have no idea what the rest of that letter said. But yes, there, there were times like that where it's, you know, barely two sentences make it through on a sheet of paper. Wow. Wow. <laughs> uh, so you had talked about some people still just, even though the propaganda out there to the American people is this is a patriotic way to do it. It's going to save us space and money, but people still chose to then send their own first class, first class postage. Um, why, why in this era of, you know, heightened patriotism, do you have like records or just information about why people did make that choice besides stationary? Yeah, I, I wish somebody had done that that survey of going to, to customers and say, why did you choose this and not that? But uh, but thinking about where, um, about how much of the campaign was focused on people uh, having to adapt what they're used to doing um, and convincing of them. Uh, it really points me to, it's just something that you're used to doing the habit of, of doing and this is something new. And do you really want to pick up something new where the rest of your your world and everything else is changing so rapidly? Can't I just use my own stationery? Um, and some people have a, a real sense of of themselves in that um in in their handwriting and in their stationery. And that is a part of why V mail um why the government and the military wanted letters to be conveyed because it's that physical piece, person to person. It's that sense of, of home, that sense of connection, that tactile. And that was acknowledged that there's this um, tactile ex experience that, um, that there, there's a connection to home. And so some people wanted to have their own handwriting sent um, and not a Cop photocopy of their handwriting the um, actual so. ink mm -hmm. yeah exactly thank you uh one last question and i know you had said that the military after world war ii did not bring back this use of microfilm um but we certainly engaged in other wars sending hundreds and thousands of troops and so there was still going to be that need for transportation um what changed or what did they turn to um, there was a long period where it was, it's just a uh, regular mail. A lot of that was due to a lot of lessons learned from World War II about how to do the logistics of um, shipping goods, shipping, uh, moving people uh, to a front. Um, and that made a big change. Uh, big changes happened after the Vietnam War about looking at how to collect up all that mail and palletize. I think I still have the photo up there of all those sacks and sacks of mail behind. Um, there's uh, Navy personnel there. That was was changed to really sort of big boxes and things that are all wrapped up and can easily fit on an airplane. But there's still been uh, experiment with um, a different sort of hybrid kind of mail that came uh, during the Iraqi war um, and uh, uh, war in, uh, operations in Afghanistan of recent years. And that was, again, inspired by a British system that used uh, the Internet um, and combined that with physical mail. So uh, both the Marine Corps and the Army instituted uh, mail systems where people in the States could uh, log in to an interface online, type a letter, um, and that was quickly transferred uh, on the on the internet. And then that information was downloaded overseas and printed out 
because again, it's important to have that physical piece of paper uh, delivered. And so high tech for the time. And now we're like text message. So, well, (laughs) thank you. Um, I do have one more question since we are in the holiday season. Do you know offhand or have a close idea how many letters to Santa the Smithsonian has in its collection? Oh, goodness. I don't know. I want to know that now. (laughs) I don't know of any letters in our collection to Santa, but uh, many of the other Smithsonian museums have, uh, you know, can always find letters in collections because historians really rely on that, uh, on the correspondence, particularly uh, personal correspondence, but also, you know, business and official correspondence to help us document what the history is. So for me, it's going to be a question of what does our contemporary records of uh, what how we communicate now, what is that going to look like for a historian in the future? Yes. But um, now I'm going to go and do that search online on the Smithsonian collection search and see if I can find any letters from Santa. In the well, if you, if you send that answer, I'm happy to send it to our registrants so they can have the answer too. Lynn, thank you so much for your time. On the behalf of the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, um, thank you guests for joining us today. We hope that you've enjoyed today's program and our time with Lynn Heidelbaugh of the Smithsonian's National Postal Museum. And um, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and provide your feedback in the survey that will be in your email shortly. Thank you for joining us. This concludes our program.